Hallo. Hallo. Okay. All right. So today we'll continue our discussions on multi-arm bandit. And to begin with, we'll talk about Gittins index and Wittels index. And then we will move on to the reinforcement learning problem where the, un un the distributions are unknown. Uh, so in the Gittins index, oh, uh, before we, let's, let's talk about Gittins index first. So we have n bandit processes, so we have a family of n alternative bandit processes. Uh, you can only pull one arm at a time. So only one bandit can be active at a time. Others have to be passive or um, other bandits have to be frozen and only one of the bandit can be uh, can, can have a continuation control. So that's pulling one arm at a time. And what else? Discounted cost. Sorry, not cost, discounted reward. <coughs> so my J of mu is expected value of mu summation RJT, SJTT, alpha raised to T, T equals 0 to infinity, given SJ0 is given by some SJ0. So you start with some initial condition and Every time you pull uh, the arm JT, so JT is the index of the arm, index of the arm pulled at time T. Okay? So today we are going to prove uh, following Weber 1992. The proof is intuitive because it makes use of the fact that, uh, that you want to pull the arm that gives you maximum return on investment. So the optimal policy, policy, Pull the arm that gives max return on investment. So solve assignment problems first that are easy to solve because then you can solve it and get done with it earlier. Or um, solve the problems that give you maximum uh, points in the assignment and then look into more complicated problems or problems that have more higher uh, marks at a later point of time, okay? Now, let me start with, a, with the following problem. You want to eat a sandwich and I want to sell a sandwich. What, how should I price it? How should I price a sandwich? What's the strategy for pricing a sandwich? that you want to eat. Any thoughts? Yeah. Well, assuming that the seller is selling many sandwiches, I would assume it's the marginal cost to sell one more sandwich for whatever your... Okay, so marginal cost is one way. Marginal cost of making a sandwich is one way of pricing a sandwich. What's the other way of pricing a sandwich? 
no competitors, just just a seller and a buyer. Yeah. The maximum price the buyer would accept. Right. The maximum price the buyer would accept. Right. That's another way to price a sandwich. Uh, okay. So I want to sell you a sandwich. You are there. I am there. A sandwich is there. And I know that from my past experience that a buyer comes to me. If I sell the sandwich for one dollar, they will definitely buy it. I sell it for ten dollars, they'll buy it and be very unhappy about it. But if I sell it for ten dollars one cent, they will definitely go away. Okay, so ten dollars is what the buyer is willing to pay at the maximum. Okay, so that's the way to price a sandwich. That's one of the ways of pricing a sandwich. Now consider a problem where you get discounted rewards. Okay, so just consider one bandit process, just one assignment, one project that you want to work on, and you are going to get discounted rewards. So a sandwich is something you eat now and then that's it. It's done, right? It's finished. Uh, here you have a situation where you pull an arm and you get a reward every point of time. Um, what should be a way to figure out the cost of pulling the arm? Okay, so so I want to price the arm. I want to price the pulling of arm. So here is a way to come up with a way to price the price the arm at a specific. Uh, initial state. So pick one bandit, pick any bandit, I am going to define a fair charge gamma j of s j as the supremum over all new greater than 0, nu or gamma, let me use gamma, supremum over all gamma greater than 0, supremum of gamma such that, let us not make it greater than 0, it could be any gamma, such that the summation alpha raised to t are J S J T minus gamma T equals 0 to infinity is greater than equal to 0. Oh, the expectation and I need to start with initial condition S J given Okay, so the idea is as follows. I want to, so, so in the original problem, you pick a bandit and you play the bandit, play that particular arm and you get a reward. Okay, now I am changing the question and I am saying, okay, I am going to charge you to play an arm. My question is what should be the fair charge? What should be a fair cost for that particular arm? So the idea is as follows, um, so if I begin with the initial condition SJ, okay, and I am always pulling the arm, the same arm, okay, so this is pick any bandit J, uh, so I am just concentrating on one of the bandits and at every point of time you have to pay gamma and then you have to play the bandit and then you have to pay gamma and then you have to play the bandit and so on and so forth 
and every time you get a reward RJ of SJT, so SJT is the state of the Markov chain uh, J and so this is the reward minus the cost of playing the arm uh, discounted with alpha raised to T and oh there is a I think there is a tau as well okay I need to add I need to add a stopping time sup over all tau tau okay uh, so I'm going to pull the arm again and again until I reach a time tau when it is no longer beneficial for me to pull the arm so if I have solved all the assignment problem then it's not it's not uh, required of me to do the assignment again and again because I have already solved the assignment right so you keep pulling the arm until it is no longer feasible the reward doesn't justify pulling the arm again and again so you kind of retire from uh, playing that particular arm j and tau is a stopping time tau is any stopping rule and we are taking supremum over tau supremum over all stopping rules so tau takes into account all the possible states that you have visited so far and then decides whether to stop playing the arm because the cost is too high or continue playing the arm because the cost doesn't cost is able to justify the expected reward I'm going to get in the future okay so this is uh, called a fair charge of playing uh, arm j if you init initialize with state sj this is one way to price the arm the bandit j playing of bandit j initialized with state sj now for the stopping rule that achieves this supremum what do you think the sign here is going to be okay so what should I so if gamma equals to gamma j s j then for any optimal stopping rule stopping rule let's say tau star what do you think this expression this expectation is going to be equal to should be equal to 0 because if it is strictly positive so remember it could be either positive or 0 if it is strictly positive I can always increase the value of gamma in order to set this expected value equal to 0 and that would that is where the supremum would be achieved for this gamma okay so for any optimal stopping rule and for gamma equals to the fair charge this whole expectation is going to be equal to 0 and this would imply that
ओके एनी क्वेश्चन सो फार या Uh, so this is op so right now we are not talking about policies. This is just a stopping rule. So stopping rule means that when are you going to stop playing that particular arm? And the idea is you will stop playing the arm only when the rewards do not justify the cost. Okay. Okay. Everyone agrees with this particular statement. Okay, so if gamma is equal to gamma j s j, then for the optimal stopping rule, we will satisfy this particular expression. Okay, now what happens if the stopping rule is not optimal, but gamma is still equal to gamma j x s j? What happens for a non-optimal stopping time? So I'm charging you a fair amount of money, fair amount of money that I should be charging you, but you are not stopping at an optimal time. Then what happens? So since it's a fair charge and will never go into the negative, uh, the user profits when the stopping rule is non-optimal. So is, so I want to get, it? I want to figure out what should the sign here be if I replace tau star with any other tau which is not optimal. Okay, so for non-optimal tau, my expected reward is going to be less than equal to the cost that I have paid for it. Right? So if I, if I know how, when to stop, then the expected reward will be exactly the same as the cost that I have paid for it. If I, instead I stop at some random time, which is not necessarily optimal, then in that case I will pay more, but I will get less. Yeah. So when your optimality discussion there is cited because it's optimal from the person pulling the arm, not the seller. Not the, the seller, seller. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not talking about the seller. The seller has fixed the fair charge, okay? And now, from the person who is making the decision of whether to buy uh, the right to play the arm or not, uh, I'm looking at it from his or her perspective. Okay? So we have proved, not proof, but we have, uh, I mean, this is essentially the proof. We have shown two equation. I fix the price of the arm as the fair charge, initialized with state SJ. And when I do that, then I get two inequality, two, uh, uh, two expressions in the first expression, if my stopping rule is optimal, then the cost I pay is the same as the reward, expected reward I get. If I pick a non-optimal stopping rule, then the cost that I pay is higher than the reward that I'm going to get in expectation. Okay. Okay, any questions about that? All right. Now, let's consider the following process. Uh, I have a question. So, yeah. this inequality holds even if tau is greater than tau star? So, so you could have multiple optimal stopping rules, right? Okay. So, no matter which optimal stopping rule you pick, this is correct. Okay. And no matter which non-optimal stopping rule you pick, this would hold. Okay. So, 
if tau star plus 1 is non-optimal, then of course this would hold. If tau star is, if tau star plus 1 is optimal, then this equality would hold. Okay. <clears throat> now here is the idea. Yeah. This, yeah, the, 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 the thing that achieves the supremum here. Sorry, how? How can tau be any optimal stopping time? So tau actually in that situation is fixed, right? No, the, the tau is a stopping rule. So tau depends on tau maps the state history to when to stop. Yeah, we have taken the supremum over all possible stopping times. Well, you know, supremum could be achieved at multiple oh, stopping rules, right? You could have four, five, twenty, hundred thousand stopping rules that are optimal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now here is the game that Weber constructed. So imagine yourself going into a casino and the casino owner charges you a certain amount of money potentially the fair charge for playing the bandit J again and again, okay? So what's going to happen? So you, uh, the bandit is changing the state at every point of time, okay? And so you will, and you know the exact uh, expressions for the reward, the transition probability and things like that, okay? So you can do infinite amount of computation in your head. So if, so you start with some initial state if the, and the, the, the casino owner is going to charge you a fair charge and you say, well, you know, I'm neither gaining money nor am I losing money, so let's just play the bandit. Um, and then you will play and then you will play and then you will play and at some point of time you will reach a state where it's no longer useful um, Okay, so sj0, sj1, sj2, and so on. So this is the state evolution. So this is one sample path of the state evolution. Then there is a fair charge at that particular state. And then there is a prevailing charge. So let's say the fair charge is dollar five, dollar six, dollar three, SJ three, dollar four, and so on. Maybe dollar seven. <coughs> okay. So the prevailing charge is what the casino owner is actually asking you to pay. All right. So you enter the casino and the casino owner charges you dollar five to play the bandit. What would you do? You will play it because the casino owner is charging you a fair charge for playing the bandit because you know that you are starting from initial state SJ zero. So prevailing charge remains the same. Yeah. Why is the rule that we play when it's balanced there? Because in expectation, we won't ever get you are, money. Yeah, you're not getting money, but you're not losing money either. Okay. So if it is zero dollars, you are fine with it. You will play the bandit. Now the next time, it charges dollar five again, but you know that the fair charge is dollar six. So you will play again because you expect to gain if you continue to play. Now you reach state SJ2, and here, the prevailing charge, the fair charge is dollar three. So what would the casino owner do in order to continue to make you play? How much should it charge you? Remember that the fair charge is dollar three. Okay? Yeah. Three dollars. Three dollars. Because if it charges you three dollar and fifty cents, you will say, okay, I'm going to stop here because 
it doesn't make sense to me. My rewards are not going to be the same commensurate with the, the expected reward is not commensurate with what I'm paying for it. So the casino owner, owner, in order to continue, in order to make you play again and again, again and again, it has to charge you a lower amount of money. Now again, at this time, it will continue to charge you the same amount of money because the fair charge now is much higher than what you were, your, what you are actually paying. So what the casino owner is doing is showing you a posted price, which is always decreasing. Okay, not decreasing, but at least non-increasing. But the fair charge could be a, a, a completely different sequence. So in some sense, the prevailing charge is is kappa jt, which is min of gamma j sj0 gamma j sjt. OK, so the prevailing charge is always, in order to make you play for infinite time step, the prevailing charge must be the minimum of all the fair charge that we have seen so far. Okay, and that this expression is exactly matches the prevailing charge that you see here. So this is my kappa j1, kappa j2, kappa j3, kappa j4, and so on. Kappa J1 is minimum of fair charge. Uh, so this is, of course, oh, this is time 0, sorry. 0, 1, 2, 3, yeah. So at time 0, Kappa J is equal to $5. At time 1, Kappa J is equal to minimum of $5 and $6, so that's $5. At time 3, oh, at time 2, Kappa J2 is minimum of the three fair charges that you have seen so far, and so on and so forth, okay? So this is the prevailing charge that the uh, owner, the casino owner is charging you, and it is optimal to play all the time with this particular sequence of prevailing charges, okay? time with this this sequence of prevailing charges right Okay, so in this case, the idea is every time you feel that you should stop, the casino owner reduces the price of playing the bandit, and then you are induced to continue to play the bandit at all the time. And in fact, the expected reward that you're going to get in this case is exactly equal to the expected prevailing charge that you see uh, in this particular problem. So expected reward, is equal to the expected prevailing charge. Of course, there is a discount, right? So there is so the expected discounted reward that you are going to see is the same as expected prevailing charge, discounted prevailing charge that you will get. some function of what uh, the difference between the prevailing charge and the fair charge is? Because if, if I'm spending $5 right. and I win seven, I'm only up net two. So are we considering the reward there seven or the reward there two? Or it's the difference between the mm -hmm. outlay and the return or just the return? No, the reward is uh, this part and this is the prevailing charge that you're paying, okay? So remember, the way so the way fair charge is defined, you pay the same charge across time, but you in initial 
state is SJ to begin with, right? So, so in some sense, the cost takes into account the future rewards that you are going to get. And it makes it neutral. Neutral in the sense that you're neither gaining nor losing if you continue to play according to the optimal stopping rule. Okay? All right. So, so far we are talking about a single bandit. Okay? So, a single bandit, if you... So we define, for a single bandit, we defined a fair charge about what it costs so that your expected future reward is the same as the expected cost you are expected to pay as long as your stopping rule is optimal. For non-optimal, you will pay more, you will get less in expectation. Then we went to a casino owner and we figured out how should the casino owner charge you so that your expected reward is equal to the expected cost you are expected to pay. Um, across the sequence. So every time you want to stop, every time you want to stop, the casino owner is going to reduce the reward, re reduce the cost of playing the arm. And what you get is a, is a sequence which always not increases. So it could decrease or it could stay the same. And that's your prevailing charge. And in this case, what we have understood is that the expected discounted prevailing charge is going to be equal to the expected discounted reward that we are going to get. Now we need to interleave n such bandits together and the action that you can pick is only one bandit at a time. So let's uh, think about that particular problem. So now we have n bandits and I want to post the prevailing charge. So kappa 1t, kappa 2t, kappa 3t and for one sample path, so this is one sample path. Five, three, three, one, 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 four, 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 two, 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 six, three, one, 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 and so on. So these are the prevailing charges for three different bandits at a time. And you can only pull one arm at a time. You can only pick one of these bandits and play. And then you can stop playing that bandit and you can move on to some other bandit. So how will you pick which bandit to begin with? Yeah. So if this is, is the resting bandit or the static bandit, right. that we can jump between the rows, correct? That's right, yeah. And not be moving over. In exactly, okay. yeah, that's right. So this is a resting bandit. So if you, let's say, play this arm and then you stopped, then you can either start from here or you could start from here or you could start from anywhere else wherever you stopped the earlier, the other bandits at. So you could potentially play 4-4 four, four, and then 5-3 and then 6-3 and then 3-1 and then 4-2 and 1-1 one, one, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's very much a possibility because the bandits freeze as soon as you stop playing it. Okay. So now my question is, which bandit will you pick first to play? Yeah. K3. Why? Because as uh, so we're expecting that in the first round, the prevailing cost uh, over the first step will be six. Right. Which is our expected reward. So, so we want to go to K3 first, then we'll go to K1, then and K2 from three rounds, then we can pick again. Okay, so at time step one, t equals to one, you will play six mm -hmm. because the expected reward you are going to get is maximum uh, because that's equal to the expected prevailing charge that you expect to see. 
So at the first instance, you are going to pick k, pick uh, arm three. How many of you agree with it? How many of you agree with the fact that you are going to start with playing arm three first? Okay, so that's because the prevailing charge, expected prevailing charge, is same as the expected reward. So you will play arm six. Then what happens? Now, now you look at the prevailing charge, and that's equal to three. Okay. Now what are you going to do? I heard someone answer that question. What will you do? Yeah. You just go to K1, which is the return of five. Okay, so this is number two because you expect a higher return five here. So, so now you are deciding between five, four, and three. Okay, and of course uh, five seems a higher prevailing charge, so you expect to get maximum reward here in comparison to four and three, and therefore you will pick five. And then what will you do? You will pick four. Uh, now you have to decide between three, four, three. So you will pick four. Okay, so I'm I'm picking the arm six, five, four, four. It's not the arm index, but the prevailing charge index. Uh, not the prevailing charge index, but the prevailing charges. So six, five, four, four, four. Then three, three. Then three. Then two. 2, 2, then 1, 1, 1, and so on. Okay, so you are picking the arm with the maximum prevailing charge first. That's the index policy. That's the Giddens index policy. So you pick arm with maximum prevailing charge. Okay, this is the Gittins index policy. This is Gittins index policy, where the Gittins index is the same as the prevailing charge. Okay, so the Gittins index equals to prevailing charge over 1 minus alpha. So in order to be consistent with Gittin's original proof, you have to divide it by 1 minus alpha here. Alpha is the discount factor. But you know you are just uh, scaling the index, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah? Shouldn't it be a word now that's not an index? Because what we have listed for the prevailing charge is yeah. a word value, not which bandit we pick to optimally get that. Right. So the index. So the, remember, the index, uh, let me remind you what an index policy was. So mu is an index policy if there exist mappings mu1 to mu n such that mu of s is equal to arg max mu j s j j equals 1 to n so this is the gittins index this is gittins index the gittins index induces a policy when you pick the arg max of among all possible indices okay so this is the prevailing charge so Gittin's index is nu j s j is gamma j s j over 1 minus alpha. This gamma is the prevailing charge, the, the fair charge that we talked about earlier. <coughs> okay, so Gittin's original proof had some index that he has proposed. Uh, in the Weber's uh, proof, the indices are the, uh, the fair charge over, the, so gamma j is the fair charge. And so in order to make sure that the two expressions are the same, you have to divide it by 1 minus alpha. So this, this 
index is in uh, Gittens, 1970 paper, and this index is in Weber's. Uh, 1992 paper. Okay. Yeah. So, um, how would this algorithm tolerate if we had uh, varying numbers of leading zeros? Uh, it's it's so you will not you will not pick that on at all. But varying numbers of leading zeros until it gets to some positive value. So prevailing charge always goes down. It never goes up. Oh. So if it is zero, then you won't go to one. Okay. All right. So <coughs> so in this case, the Gittins index policy is to pick the uh, arm with the maximum prevailing charge, and the rest of the paper actually tries to prove that this policy is the optimal policy to pick. And the reason for that is this statement, this statement, and this statement. Okay? So the three equalities, well, three expressions, so this is equality, inequality, and equality, uh, they together imply that this is the optimal policy to apply for this particular Gittins, for the Gittins problem. So Gittin's problem is you pull one arm at a time, and you have discounted reward uh, that looks like this. So I'm not going to complete the rest of the proof. I wanted to give you the high level idea of how Gittin's went ahead and proved, not Gittin's, but what is one way to prove the Gittin's index policy is optimal, which is using maximum return on investment type of idea. And this is how you come up with that policy. And then, and the algorithm that can compute this in, uh, right. Is it using a similar line of reasoning, or is it using some more complicated? No, I think it's a very complicated linear program okay. kind of problems that they are solving. Yeah. And I've posted the paper. Uh, it's a very nice survey paper by um, by Aditya Mahajan, who's a very good friend of mine. Uh, this paper is posted on Carmen, so you can take a look at it. It's a very nice survey paper, which talks about different algorithms for computing Gittins indices for a multi-arm bandit problem. So, of course, the way to compute Gittins index is, I mean, not the way, but you need to know the reward function, and you need to know the transition probability function uh, in order to be able to compute Gittins index. So it makes use of all that information to solve uh, Comes up with so many people have come up with various algorithms which computes Gittins index. Uh, we don't quite know which is the best algorithm in terms of uh, what's the best achievable uh, complexity for computing Gittins index. So that remains uh, an open problem as of now. Now let's move on to Whittle's index, which is family of n alternative bandit processes pull m arm at a time. It's average reward. And the arm that you do not, so passive arms also, also pay for. So passive arms also accrue rewards. That's the Wittles index. Any, any question on the Gittins index part? before we jump on to Wittles index. Okay. Okay, so Whittle index, the idea is uh, you have n workers, n workers, uh, you want to put m workers on work, 
and n minus m workers should rest. Okay. So you have a Starbucks, you own a Starbucks, and there are three cashier points, um, and you have four employees, and at least one employee must be resting while the other three workers are working, and then at some point of time you will have to figure out which of the workers should rest and which of the workers should be working on the three uh, cashier register. Okay, so while the workers are resting, the state is changing, they are getting recuperated, okay. Um, and they are accruing some sort of reward. Uh, so over long periods of time, you want to come up with a policy to identify which workers should be resting and which workers should be working. Okay, so that's just one possible way to think about it. Um, so the idea is, oh, these are, these are restless bandit. States change. Uh, even if passive. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so Wittles index is for restless bandits with average reward where you pull M arms at a time. And this is one of the, uh, one of the ap application, but the other applications that are more sort of useful is if you have a large area to survey with M helicopter, so you have N nodes in a graph, you have only M helicopters to survey it. So which places should the helicopter survey um, over long periods of time? So even if a helicopter is not surveying N minus M nodes, uh, there is something happening at that node. So there may be a fire that is becoming big and you want to make sure that you send helicopters once in a while to every of those nodes in order to, uh, in order to get an understanding of what the situation is. <clears throat> okay. So we'll, we'll follow a similar line of thought. Uh, we'll start with one bandit We'll try and understand what happens with that particular bandit and then try and come up with a more general way of figuring out which M arms to pick. So assume all uh, bandits are unichain because this is an average reward problem you want to make sure that you have unichain uh, assumption so that everything works out nicely. So what do you have? So bandit J, just consider bandit J, we have GJ plus HJ SJ is equal to max R SJ1. plus P uh, P1, I use P1, yeah, P1 into H J, P J1. This is the optimality equation for bandit J. So HJ is the relative cost vector, relative value function, GJ is the gain. Remember that the gain is constant because this is a unichain MDP. And there are only two actions, zero and one. Zero means it's passive, one means it's active.
oh I need to introduce the reward function so j of mu is expected value of summation i equals 1 to n limit t goes to infinity expected t o equals to 0 to t minus 1 r j r i s i t u i t Subject to Uh, so this 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 one is easy to solve. This one is very difficult to solve. Oh, so you're saying separate? Sorry. Yeah. So yeah. Separate constraints. Not correct. At correct. The same time. Yes, not at the same time. So I, I I covered it in the previous class. So formulation one and formulation two. I'm just rewriting those two formulations in a different manner. So this is the indicator function. If this is true, then it's equal to one. If this is false, then this is equal to zero. Uh, equal m, yeah, well, uh, it has a nicer interpretation, okay? Uh, when we do the Lagrange relaxation in like five minutes, you will see that it has some interpretation. But they are equivalent interpretation, and because Wittel wrote it that way, I'm writing it that way. Because all the expressions are available for this particular constraint, okay? <coughs> okay. So this is my average reward problem for all the arms. So uit equals to zero means uh, it's in a passive state. Uit equals to one means it's uh, the project i is an active state. And I'm just considering this particular problem first, okay? So that problem is, if I look at the optimality equation for that particular problem, it's uh, for bandit j, gj is the gain, hj is the relative value function at sj is equal to max of the reward plus transition probability when the action is 1 multiplied by hj and the reward with action 0 and the transition probability uh, when the action is 0 multiplied by hj. hj is the relative value function. So this is gain and this is relative value function. I hope uh, all of you remember the average cost MDP stuff that we had studied. Uh, it's also there in your assignment, so I guess you will uh, revise it anyways. Uh, 
So this is the optimality equation. If you were, if you just had one bandit and you had to pick whether to play the bandit or not play the bandit, okay? So that's the optimality equation you will be faced with. All right. Now consider uh, the Lagrange relaxation. So, so this is the original formulation because you have only m. Uh, you can only play m arms at any point of time. So this is the original constraint, but this is an original constraint on each sample path, so it's very difficult to solve. Let's relax the constraint to have an average constraint. This is for all time t. And then we could just use a Lagrange relaxation, okay? So push this particular expectation in the cost itself and analyze that particular problem with the Lagrange multiplier. So let me use nu as the Lagrange multiplier. This is the Lagrange multiplier. Anyone remembers uh, the Lagrange multiplier theory? So we want to supremize over mu, j mu, such that uh, some constraint expected value minus n minus m equal to 0. So how do we use Lagrange relaxation? Well, you have n sup over nu j of mu plus uh, nu times expected value minus n minus m. Nu is in R and mu of course is in the space of policies. So this comes from geometric multiplier theory. Uh, it was covered in ECE 5759. <clears throat> okay? Yeah. Before we start dualizing the problem, are we going to be able to easily prove that there's no duality gap there, or is it just? Uh, so that part comes from the theory of constrained MDPs. There is no duality gap. Okay. So uh, it, it it's a it's a kind of a complicated theory. So that's why I don't want to get into it. But there is no duality gap in this particular problem because constrained MDP. So MDP with action constraints. Uh, uh, it, it's equivalent to a linear program. And because in linear programs there is no duality gap, therefore there is no duality gap here. Okay. Any other question? <clears throat> okay. So now let's analyze this particular expression. Okay. So I have expected value. So this is also an expectation, so I can push it in here, uh, put everything in the same expected framework. So I equals 1 to n. Uh, limit t goes to infinity 1 over t summation t equals 0 to capital T minus 1 r i s i t u i t minus no plus nu uit equals to 0 okay what am i missing right now oh new n minus m minus new n minus m Oh, actually new n minus m would be outside the expectation because it, 
it is not a random variable. Nu is a specific Lagrange multiplier and n minus m is a constant. So, yeah. Yeah, there will be supremum, infimum everywhere. Okay. Okay. What does this tell you? We have changed the reward structure for the average cost MDP. Okay. So now, when you are resting, when this project is in a passive phase, you get an additional amount of new in addition to the reward that you were accruing. When the project is active, UIT is equal to 1, so this term is inactive. You're only getting accruing the reward corresponding to the active phase of the project. So in passive phase, passive phase, you receive a subsidy new in addition to reward how does this subsidy come from well the subsidy is exactly equal to the lagrange multiplier for this constraint problem Oh, so this constraint is absolute, so you cannot violate the constraint for any possible state. What you are asking is a completely separate problem. What's the application you're thinking about? Um, just changing from the, the first constraint to the second constraint. Right. Um, it seems like... So, so this is the original problem we want to solve, but we cannot solve it, so we are looking at this particular problem. These are two separate formulations. Okay. So here we're just trying to solve a problem with the second constraint. Second constraint, okay? And then we will talk about the problem with first constraint later on, okay? All right. Uh, okay, so now for this particular average reward condition where you get an additional subsidy of new in addition to the reward in the passive phase would change the optimality equation here okay so let me write down the optimality equation under that condition so at subsidy new you will have g i uh, uh, g j of nu plus h j of s j comma nu equals to max p r no r j of s j comma 0 s j comma 1 plus p This would be the optimality expression under the optimal policy for bandit J. <coughs> okay. Now the goal is that the subsidy new should be adjusted in such a fashion that only 
in expectation m bandits are active at every point of time yeah does no have to be negative it could be negative in which case it would be a tax not a subsidy i mean if it's posted so it's always optimal to not activate any of the bandits oh uh, let's think about it so if new is minus infinity then this will always be maximum so you will always activate the arm if new is plus infinity then this one is always maximum and therefore you will always not activate the arm always be in a passive mode now for intermediate values of new your solution would be different okay so i'm talking about the two extremes now in the intermediate things may be different now one way to break the tie if these two values are exactly equal then the way to break the tie is to pick the passive action that's according to wittel let's just use that tie breaking rule so if if activating it gives you the same expected reward as not activating it keeping it passive then you just keep it passive okay so this is uh at the optimal subsidy new star um you will have the expression you will pick the bandits according to the arg max of this particular expression so you will activate now of course hj is a fixed point of this expression okay and gj is the gain corresponding to the subsidy new and at every point of time the way to pick the bandit to activate would be the arg max of all possible so for every j you will look at the arg max and then you will activate whichever satisfies the arg max equal to 1 and whichever satisfies arg max equal to 0 you will not activate you will keep those projects passive so that gives you a uh, one policy which is the optimal policy for uh for number 2 which and and so far we haven't really talked about how to compute the subsidy but we know there exists an optimal subsidy where uh, that would be possible now my question is does that yield an index policy can you think of an index or coming up with an index so that you can perhaps use an index policy for this particular problem looking at this expression can you think of an index relative value yeah each chain okay so the the index i have to define new j of sj i have to define i need to define new j of sj that would be the index so your proposal is to use h j of s j comma what oh okay this we need to determine the subsidy right Right, right. So, so new J, S J would be the fixed point of this particular expression. So, so you will pick new J S J such that if you increase the value, well, let me let me write down. what it will satisfy so new j s j would be the fixed point of 
R J S J comma one plus P I one H J S J equal to nu plus S J zero plus P J zero. S J and this should be for all S J. Uh, sorry. You have P one I, not P one J there. Oh yeah, yeah, J, P one J. J. Okay. So nu j s j would be a fixed point of this particular expression. So it's a horrible expression because remember h j itself is a fixed point of this particular expression. So it's a very complicated way of coming up with an index, but it's still an index, a possible index for the decision problem. And this index is known as Wittel's index. And I have no idea whether Wittel's index is computable or not. Okay, I haven't seen any papers about it, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, for specific applications, certainly people have expressions for Wittel index, but I don't know in general, given a arbitrary banded processes, whether Wittel index is computable or not. I don't know, but people have used uh, Wittel's index idea for understanding which programs to preempt in a processor and which programs to let run, especially if you have a multiprocessor setting. So Wittel's index is useful in those kind of problems. You have 20 cores in your computer and you have 500 programs running. So which of the cores should be assigned to which program at what point of time? Uh, people have proposed Wittel's index type of policies for that kind of uh, situation. <clears throat> Okay, so I hope uh, the construction of Wittel's index is clear. So HJ is a fixed point of this expression. Okay, so for various values of news for every state, you will get a different HJ and GJ and you will pick Wittel index new in such a fashion that these two are equal. So the reward with the active is the same as the reward with the passive. That's the Wittel index. And so one policy, an index policy, is to pick m arms with the highest Wittel index at that particular point of time. OK? So I just want to summarize what is known about Wittel's index. what we know so Wittel's index policy policy is not optimal for formulation 1 or 2 Second, it does very well when m comma n are large. Sorry? Uh, remember, in the second formulation, 
you have to pick a subsidy nu that satisfies all these expressions for all possible j's right and then you pick the subsidy level has to be at the right level so that you are picking on average m m actions at a time m arms at a time right so that is the truly optimal policy but it doesn't come from any index okay so this index structure has been enforced on this particular problem and therefore it's not the optimal policy but it's a suboptimal policy for the formulation 2 okay so yeah how is that then not considered uh, do out again we have there is it just because we're enforcing the structure that we no longer have the guarantee from general ambiguities uh, so the duality gap is invoked in identifying at the right subsidy so if there is a right subsidy then it means that there is no duality gap right so that's only for this expression this is a forced expression on top of so inspired by looking at this expression you come up with a Wittel index but it's not necessarily the optimal policy because the optimal policy is by picking the right subsidy level and then okay acting according to the subsidy level okay so uh, pick m comma n uh, so mu index is the index policy mu optimal is the optimal policy for formulation 1 and mu uh, star optimal policy for formulation 2 okay and we know j of mu index equals is less than equal to j of mu optimal is less than equal to j of mu star with formulation 2 so formulation 1 and mu index it could be anything it could be 2 or 1 so it doesn't matter what j you pick Let's keep it one. Okay. So we have this expression. That's because this is the optimal for uh, formulation one. Index policy is not necessarily optimal because we have forced a structure on the policy. So therefore, it's not optimal. Therefore, you have an inequality here. And here the inequality is because mu star is the optimal policy which comes from the optimal subsidy and you have a much more relaxed constraint in formulation 2 in comparison to formulation 1. So therefore you have this inequality because this is a much more general problem. This is a very restrictive problem. Okay. Uh, it turns out that under some conditions which are very difficult to state uh, but perhaps very common in practice if your m and n are very very large then the index policy is approximately optimal because this term converges to this term okay so what we know is j1 index well let me write it as a as a theorem complicated conditions imply that j1 mu index over n converges to j2 mu star over n as n goes to infinity m goes to infinity m over n is fixed at some constant alpha ok 
Okay. So what this implies, this theorem implies, assuming these complicated conditions are satisfied, and according to the authors, so this, who are these authors? Weber and Weiss, 1990. So according to these authors, um, most situations, these complicated conditions would be satisfied. But of course, they can't say for sure. Uh, they had a very difficult time finding a case where index policy is not optimal. Okay, so that's what they say. The way they generated problem, they couldn't find, it took them a lot of time to figure out a, a situation where index policy is not optimal. So perhaps their, their view is most of the time index policy would be approximately optimal if n was very, very large. Okay, and of course m over n is equal to alpha. So that's their viewpoint, which they have proved. Okay, so that's all we know. So Wittel index is not optimal. If you have very large number of n and very large number of m, Wittel index is perhaps approximately optimal. No proof of approximate optimality. The approximate optimality is true if n is infinity and m is infinity. So for finite n, we don't quite know how suboptimal it is, but uh, perhaps useful. Okay. So in the next class, we'll talk about Lie and Robbins paper from 1985, a classic paper on multi-arm bandit. And then subsequently, we'll talk about a lot of bandit problems where the state evolution is IID. So ST plus one has no correlation whatsoever with ST. So we'll talk about those problems in the next class.